Well, good morning. First of all, I'd like to say thank you for joining us throughout this week. And I hope that as we've been digging into this passage of Scripture, 2 Corinthians 4, that each of these lessons has been an encouragement to you and has given you something that has both challenged you and given you something to meditate on throughout the rest of the day. What I'd like to do this morning is I'd like to conclude our Anchored in the Word studies for the week. And we'll do that by looking at the last piece and then some final questions and encouragements for us. And so let's read the text again, 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verses 1 through 7, and then we'll look at this final little piece as we conclude for the week. <coughs> it says this, Therefore, seeing we have this ministry, <coughs> as we've received mercy, we faint not, but have renounced the hidden things of dishonesty, not walking in craftiness nor handling the word of God deceitfully, but by manifestation of the truth, commending ourselves to every man's conscience in the sight of God. But if our gospel be hid, it is hid to them that are lost, in whom the God of this world hath blinded the minds of them which believe not, lest the light of the glorious gospel of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine unto them. For we preach not ourselves, but Christ Jesus the Lord, and ourselves your servants for Jesus' sake. For God, who commanded the light to shine out of darkness, hath shined in our hearts, to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. But we have this treasure in earthen vessels, that the excellency of the power may be of God and not of us. Now, as we've been looking at these passages, we've talked about the ministry that has been entrusted to us. We've talked about this daily supply of mercy and grace that God has given us to do the work that he's called us to do. And so as we've worked our way, today what I'd like us to do is I'd like us to focus in our attention on God's plan or God's program. How does God actually reach people with the gospel? Well, I love the statement that's made in verses 6 and 7 because he just lays it out so very, very clearly. It says, For God, who commanded the light to shine out of darkness, hath shined in our hearts, to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. We have this treasure in earthen vessels that the excellency of the power may be of God and not of us. What an absolutely amazing statement for us to read and then for us to consider. What the text is literally saying is that God's plan of saving people is that he works through people like you and me. And so when we think about this issue of Satan blinding the eyes of those who do not believe and that they are lost and that their greatest need is the gospel, God is not just passively sitting back and watching people who are in, in, in tremendous danger, who are ultimately going to be condemned for all of eternity. He doesn't just sit back on his hands and watch them and say, well, it's really unfortunate that you don't have access to the gospel or that there's no way of salvation. God actually loves people. He loves them and he desires for them to be saved. And he takes action toward bringing them to himself. If God just left us where we are, we would have no hope. But what we see in these verses is that God is not passive. He is active in saving souls. And so that action starts with him, first of all, securing a basis for us to have salvation. There would be no point in, in somebody being called to God if there wasn't a basis through which he could be reconciled to God. And so in 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 18, he says that we were not redeemed with corruptible things like silver and gold received by our vain tradition from our fathers, but with the precious blood of Christ as of a lamb without blemish and without spot, who verily was foreordained before the foundation of the world, but manifest in these last days for you who by him do believe in God, who raised him from the dead and gave him glory, that your faith and hope might be in God. What a great statement, that before the foundation of the world, God determined to establish a basis for people who had not yet fallen into sin, but one day would fall through Adam, that those people could be reconciled to him. And he not only purposed in himself to accomplish this purpose, but we see that he says, he was manifest in these last days for you. He literally accomplished the plan. So God's active role in saving us begins with establishing a basis for salvation. But the second part to this is that God issues a command. And in verse 6, he says that he commanded the light to shine out of the darkness. 
It's like in Genesis 1 where God says, let there be light and there was light. God commanded light to shine out of the darkness. And he's referring to how people hear the gospel when they're there in the darkness. Reminds me of Romans chapter 10 verses 14 and following where it says, how can they call on him in whom they've not believed? And how can they believe in him of whom they have not heard? And how shall they hear without a preacher? How shall they preach except they be sent? And then he says, how beautiful are the feet of them that preach the gospel of peace and bring glad tidings. He says that faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God and that their sound went into all the world and their words unto the ends of the world. What I love about that Romans 10 passage is he lays out this logical progression and it starts with the fact that people cannot they can't call on the Lord if they don't first believe on the Lord. And they can't believe on the Lord if they don't hear the gospel. And they won't hear the gospel if there's not someone preaching the gospel. No one's going to preach the gospel unless somebody tells them to preach the gospel. But someone has told them to preach the gospel. And people have gone out and preached the gospel. And therefore, there are people who are believing on the gospel because God commanded the light to shine out of the darkness. The third thing that we see is that he worked personally in our hearts through the gospel. And so he doesn't just say there's people out there who need the gospel, and there's people out there that I've commanded to give the gospel, and those people are taking the gospel to those other people. This is not a spectator sport. It's not like watching a football game where we sit in the stands and we watch other people do it. This is something that God wants us personally to be involved in. And so it says that he hath shined in our hearts. What an amazing statement. So while he's making the argument that people need to be saved and God commands the light to shine out of the darkness, he then turns it personally, says, and he shined in your hearts so that you're a part of this process of bringing people to faith alone in Christ. That's what he's saying. This is God saying he uses people to reach people and you're one of those people that he uses to reach people. He then explains the why, and the fourth reason is that he reminds us that he didn't just save us to give us fire insurance. He saved us to be a part of his plan of bringing people to himself. And so in verse 6 he says that he did this to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. The question is, who did he want to give that light to? The answer is the unbeliever. The other question is, well, who is he using to bring the light to the unbeliever? And the answer is, it's you. So God didn't just shine the light into your heart and my heart so that we would believe the gospel and escape hell and then leave us there. He shined the light of the gospel into our hearts so that we would hear it, believe it, be saved from our sins, and then be a conduit through which he reaches into the lives of others who are stumbling about in the darkness. This is what missions is all about. It's about God calling people to himself, working through those people to call other people to himself. And we have the privilege of being a part of that. And so I love this last statement that he makes in the section we're looking at. It says he does this so that the excellency of the power may be of God and not of us. He reminds us that God is choosing to work through people who are weak, who lack motivation, who get discouraged, who sometimes are fickle, who sadly are often disobedient to God's commands. God chooses to use them and work through them. And this is all a testimony to the power and the greatness and the goodness and the wisdom and the majesty of God. And so you and I are people that get to be up front and close to the work that God is doing because he's doing it through us. It is his power and it is his word and it is his work, but we get to participate in it. And so that leaves me with a couple of final questions to ask you as we go into the weekend and we think about all these things we've talked about. The first question that I have for you is this. Do you today need your heart to be refocused? Is it possible that in the busyness of your life with all the challenges and all the difficulties and all the discouragements that go on around you, is it possible that you have lost your focus on this very important issue that God expects us to be actively and personally involved in? 
If you have lost your focus, I ask you, plead with the Lord to help you to refocus and allow the scriptures that we've talked about this week to be a tool through which he refocuses your attention. Second question, do you need your passion for Christ's gospel and the salvation of the world around you, the nations, to be rekindled? It's like we're sitting around this campfire and we've watched all these flames coming up for several hours and now those flames have died down and all of those chunks of wood that we had thrown in there that were once a, a, a major flame and were warming us, they're now broken down coals down in the ground at, at the bottom of this fire pit. And the truth is you don't see any glow, but there's still heat down there in those embers. And sometimes what we need to do is, is get something, kind of stir those embers a little bit, blow on those ember, ember, embers, put some new wood on the fire, and all of a sudden the fire will erupt again. And sometimes that's what our hearts need. We need somebody to stir up those embers, blow freshly on those embers. And so then we are once again re-energized and refocused to do the work that God has called us to do. If that's you this morning, I want to encourage you, ask the Lord to help you and get into the text in front of us that we've looked at this week because God will use that to re-stir your heart. And so I challenge you this way finally. Let us meditate on these things and give our heart entirely to them. We've been given a sacred trust. All of us have. If you're saved, you have been given this trust. God has poured out his mercy on us for a very distinct purpose, not just to bring us to salvation, but also to help us to be channels through which he reaches into the lives of people. Let's get on our knees. Let's ask him to stir up our hearts again, that we would have a deeper love, a deeper affection, a deeper burden for the salvation of the lost around us. And lastly, Let's remember that we are the people that God uses to reach people. And so if we want to see him work through us, we need to be actively submitted to and obedient to his purpose that he has for us. I want to challenge you as we go into the weekend to think about these things and ask the Lord to help us to be the people that he's called us to be. If this has been an encouragement to you this week, I hope that you'll share that. And Lord willing, next week we'll get to meet again. Lord willing, on Sunday, we'll be able to see each other, and I look forward to the missionary that we'll have with us. It's going to be a great Sunday. I am anticipating God's, God's great work in our hearts through his word. Have a blessed weekend. Talk to you later. Bye now.